Our next panel focuses on people who knew how to build what Evans called real computing systems. To pursue this vision, he recruited a number of faculty, um, Burroughs architect Bob Barton, uh, who you're going to hear about in this panel, and also Ivan Sutherland, who you'll hear lots from uh, somewhere in the audience there. Um, and uh, and uh, it's our great benefit that we'll be hearing from him about real computing systems of the future. I also wanted to recognize Tom Stockham, who was also part of this crew. He was a pioneer in digital sound recording and editing, and he later became the co-investigator of the ARPA project I mentioned previously. So uh, let me introduce Professor Balas Rajiv Balasubramonian, who will moderate this panel. Sorry about that. <laughs> At least as much as these people will allow him to. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rajiv Balasubramanian. Uh, I'm myself celebrating my 20th anniversary at the College School of Computing. Uh, as is Sneha and as is John Rigger, I don't know if he's here, but yeah, there's a few of us celebrating our 20th anniversary too. Uh, and in fact, I was hired by one of the illustrious people on this panel. Al was, was, was a huge factor in me joining here. Um, and you know this is this is going to be a Pardon. great panel. You know, I'm really excited to host this this panel on on on, uh, um, on creativity. One of the and uh, you know, let me let me introduce them the in the chronological order of them joining here, uh, which will also be in the same order that you know they'll give their opening remarks and then then we'll move move to questions. So first we have we have Dwayne Call. Uh, he was a PhD student here from 1967 to 71, uh, and, and, and this was followed by stints at BYU, uh, at Burroughs, and in Moss. Uh, he founded or co-founded several companies that designed and built machines, uh, Computer Systems Architects, Modular Research Institute, Trellis, and Vinca. Next, uh, we have Al Davis. Uh, he arrived here as a grad student in, um, in 1969. Uh, Al has had a storied career in both academia and industry. Uh, he spent time at University of Waterloo and, of course, here. Uh, uh, his industrial stints include uh, at Fairchild, Schlumberger, Intel, HP, and now at NVIDIA. And then, finally, we have Chuck Seitz, uh, who arrived here uh, as, as faculty in late 1969. Uh, he also had a stint at, at Caltech, and you know some of the architects in the room may recognize him as Bill Daly's advisors, as, as, as Bill Daly's ad, ad, advisor. So, uh, you know, he's of our time. So, so, so I think that, that's a name that that, that, that we recognize. Uh, he also co-founded Miricom, right? And so one of the first things that I saw when I got to grad school was the Mirinet network, right? And so, uh, uh, when Mary mentioned that, you know, that's kind of the bell that 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 uh, uh, that went off in my head. Uh, he's been uh, elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1992 uh, for, pioneering, for pioneering contributions to the design of asynchronous and concurrent computing systems. Uh, he received the 2011 IEEE Seymour Cray uh, Computer Engineering Award for innovations in high-performance message passing architectures and networks. So, you know, as you see from this, from, from, from these bios, you know, there's there's a common theme. They've all spent significant amounts of time in both industry and academia, and they've spent that time you know, building actual systems. Right? And so hopefully we'll get some of that insight uh, as, 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 um, you know, as part of this panel. Right? And so you know, they'll each make opening remarks. We'll move to questions by you and us. And you know, based on the last panel, I think there'll be enough questions that I don't have to lean on my, my pre-prepared list of questions. So with that, uh, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dwayne. Thank you, Rajiv. Yep. Uh, I think, Rajiv, don't we have about two hours? Is that, is that, <laughs> you get eight minutes an hour. Oh. You took 30 seconds of that. So. <laughs> it can't be done. Uh, I just took all the notes I had put down, and I tried to keep them short, but I'm just going to set them aside right now. In listening to the members of the last panel, I have to tell you, it, it was a graduate program. It wasn't an undergraduate program, but it was so freewheeling in comparison to what the previous gentlemen have had to deal with. I came in 1967. I, uh, the, the program really had been going in full force since about a year before. 
Uh, Dave Evans was there in 1966 at least. Uh, my first office mate, Alan Kay, started about a year before, about in, about in 1966 fall, I think. And then I came along in 1967, a, year, a, a couple of years before these two. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm older than these two guys by quite a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Chuck Seitz is probably a year or two younger than I am, but he's on my PhD. He's a signature mm -hmm. on my PhD. He was really one of the bright people that came out of MIT and came to Utah and, uh, and taught us a lot of things. Well, anyway, uh, I started here as a not very good undergraduate student. I had done lots of things. It took me six years to get my BS, which included one whole semester wiped out because I took a bunch of my roommates and we went down to Acapulco <laughs> at Christmas time. Never got back in time from finals because the car broke down. The other guys took the bus up and took their finals. I stayed with my old 53 Pontiac station wagon that had a hole blown in a piston. <laughs> from the from the very uh, sulfur laden gas in Mexico. Anyway, uh, right at the end of my career, I started taking a couple of programming classes, and I happened to just do one for a faculty member. Right at the end, I did one for a faculty member that nobody else got to, not, got the solution for. The, the the fellow who was head of the computer center couldn't get a solution for it, and he'd been working on it all weekends long. He'd run the computer uh, for probably four or five months. And I happened to crack the nut, and, and, uh, and he was impressed. And, and, and so when school was getting out, it was the height of the Vietnam drafting era. Everybody was going <coughs> to Vietnam. I presumed I was going to go from getting my bachelor's degree and go right down and report to the draft. Uh, my wife got a letter. I got a letter, but she opened it. And she's sitting down here. And Tamara opened it up and said I was 5A. She calls the draft board and said, what, what time does he have to report? When? You know, so it was like right away. And they said, 5A, that means he's too old to be drafted. I, I told you it took me f six years for my undergraduate, and I'd been on a, a Mormon mission before that. And, and um, so they said, well, if he hasn't had a deferment, he's out at age 26. Everybody had deferments. Everybody did. I always signed up, but my Wisconsin draft board never processed the papers. I never noticed. And I was out and didn't know what I was going to do in the fall of in the spring of 1967. The fellow that I had written the program for in the class said, "You need to go to graduate school." He didn't even know anything about my draft, not draft status. And he says, "You need to go to graduate school." And I said, "Oh, not 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 me." And he says, "Now I'm going to write a letter." So somewhere in the middle of the summer, I got a, I got a letter saying I could come up to the University of Utah, and I was provisionally admitted. Uh, I got up there, and the, I remember my first day, David Evans came and took me by the arm and, and brought me into an, an office. And a and, uh, fellow was sitting there. I found out his name was Alan Kay. And he says, Alan, would you let Dwayne Call have a seat in this office? And would you show him the ropes? And, and, and he did. <laughs> but he was, he was a hard act to follow. And I've got, I got to write something down here or start something up here, because I've got to make sure I, I stop in time. <laughs> so. So, uh, hey, yeah, I can't do that. You, you, you tell me, OK? Give me a good nudge when I got a minute to go, Al, OK? So, so um, uh, as the semester started to move on, my papers finally came in the mail saying that I was admitted, because I was provisional before then. And I opened the envelope, and it said I was admitted to the PhD program. And, and I was shocked, because I thought, wow, if they're going to let me in, I would maybe work on a master's because that was you know, right up there. And, um, and it said I was a candidate in the PhD program. So I quickly made an appointment, a rush appointment with Dave Evans. And I went into his office. And he said, you can tell. He said, you seem agitated. And I said, I am. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, I applied for the master's program right here. It says I'm admitted to the PhD program. I said, that's a, and he said, so? And I said, that's a big mistake. And he says, no, it's not. He says, I changed your application. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, you changed my application. And he said, sure. He says, why don't you start out setting the goal higher? And he said, if it doesn't work out, maybe you can pull back a little bit. And, and, and then I said, but Dr. Evans, my, my gra grades 
And he stopped me right there and said, oh, are you under the impression that you got in here because of your grades? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, well, no, 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 I understand. And, and, and he said, look, let's just not talk about this ever again. Why don't you jump in, go for it. <laughs> Alan Kay was unusual. He told me, the first thing he told me to do was to go down to the library and read everything that had been written about computers to that date. I mean, that was Alan Kay, because he had done that. Uh, OK. The name it was freewheeling. There were no textbooks or anything except maybe one in formal languages that we had. But, but um, everything was done by papers that were passed around. Remember, there were no copiers. There were two copiers on campus, two copy machines on campus. One w was in the administration building. We couldn't use that. And one was on the mezzanine floor of the, Mar of the, of the new Marriott Library at the time. That was it. And, and We'd get these paid. Everything was in technical, technical papers. It wasn't in, in the textbooks. So uh, Alan Kay went to Dave Evans and said, hey, these two guys over here, Alan said, just spent twelve or $15,000 of, of ARPA. It was DARPA then, but they changed the name to ARPA to get the word defense off it because a computer center had been bombed that had an ARPA, DARPA contract <laughs> and, and, um, back in Wisconsin. Uh, and so Al Alan Kay said, Dave, these two guys just spent Twelve or fifteen thousand dollars simulating the the Univac 1108 on the 1108. <laughs> it, it, it was it was a learning experience for them, but it, it Alan Kay said, "Gee, if that kind of money is possibly available, can't we get a copy machine?" <laughs> <laughs> and so, sure enough, sure enough, within a month, there was an it was an A B Dick was the name of the company. So soon there was an, an office near, the, near our offices, and our keys fit the door, and on the plaque was, was Professor A.B. Dick. And, <laughs> and we could make copies for free, and that's where everything came from. Copies were passed around. Robert Bendian down here, I remember, had a paper uh, that, that was by Edsger Dijkstra from over in the, the Netherlands, and it was about go to -less programming, programming with no go-tos. And, and uh, he lost it. If you'd ever seen his truck back in those days, you know. anyway, he lost the paper, and Bob Barton, who had procured it, said, "You better get a copy, a new copy of that paper." He says, "I'm going to have your head," and and so Robert wrote a letter to Edsker Dijkstra on a teletype because that's what we had: teletype machines, jig, 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 jig. No possible way of typing more than ten characters a second, and he wrote Dijkstra a letter on that teletype, all uppercase. Sure enough. A few weeks later, he gets a letter back from Edgar Dijkstra in all lowercase, <laughs> and, and a copy of the paper, which we all then took quickly and copied on this nice copy machine we had. And things worked that way. We got papers about what was going on at MIT and at Stanford and at Harvard, and, and, and that, was, that was how we, how, how we got our information. The other thing Alan Kay did is said, can't probably, we use some I of this? Probably ought to wind it down. OK. He said, <laughs> so, I'm real close. I, mean, I, I, I can be real close. So the other thing that Alan Kay asked for was travel money. Normally, you got to be presenting a paper if you're going to get to go to a conference or somewhere else. But Alan Kay convinced Dave that we needed to be able to travel. We needed to go out to MIT. We needed to be able to go over to Stanford and talk to the people there and see what they were doing. And so, so we, we could travel. I went up to Vancouver, British Columbia with Alan Kay to an Al Gaul 68 conference. OK. It was after a couple of years that all kinds of things started to happen, including people like Henry Garot and his other three French cohorts arrived. And, and uh, PDP-10s, a time-sharing PDP-10 arrived, some, some real f fancy machine. Anyway, and it, and it just all exploded from there. But it was freewheeling. Tom Stockham, it was, his name was Thomas G. Stockham. We found out, Alan Kay informed us, that his middle name, G, his middle initial, which we didn't know, he said, stands for God. Because <laughs> Tom was that perfect, you know. Okay, I'm going to shift over to, to Alan Davis. All right. I showed up a couple years after Dwayne. I was a PhD student from 69 to 72. Uh, I arrived with a bunch of people that came from MIT. Some people, like Chuck here, came as faculty members. Some people came as students. Um, and 
I had already been accepted to go to grad school at MIT and was thinking I'd stay there for the second and third degree, just like most uh, mm -hmm. MITers were doing in the day. Uh, but I decided to cast a wider net. I heard, I don't know whether I heard this directly from Ivan Sutherland or whether from somebody who had heard it from Ivan Sutherland who was impressed beyond belief. Um, mind you, I was also born in Utah and a very avid skier since prenatal. Um, <laughs> and I came to Utah because of Ivan Sutherland and skiing. Both forces were very strong. Mm -hmm. When I got here, I was just amazed. The biggest, in retrospect, the things that most were unique and impressed me was the quality of the people and the freedom. There were no rules. And in fact, one of my first things I did was trying to figure out what the rules were. I read everything I could get my hands on, what courses did I have to take, what Chinese menu theorem did I need to look at, and I was confused beyond belief. Well, I was pretty clueless on lots of things, so that's not a rare case. But <laughs> I decided I'd get a meeting with Dave because he always wanted to meet the new grad students. So I went to Dave and I said, hey Dave, I'm just, uh, I'm a bit lost here. Um, I need to know what the rules are. And he says, what do you mean rules? And I said, well, what courses do we need to take? He says, ah, you need to take this number of hours because the graduate stool and the university says you have to, you know, suffer through this many hours of courses. But really, we have no rules. And in fact, pretty much every course you take is something that you can take multiple times, including one of my favorite courses that was taught by Chuck, CS699. We met at Alta on Fridays. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a real course, guys, but, but, but it had a number, 699. Yes. <laughs> and we spoke on ones and zeros up the chair, so it was work. Um, the bottom line is the quality of the faculty was just amazing. You had Ivan Sutherland. You had Thomas Godstock, as you, guys, as you now know. Um, we had Chuck. We had people that were just wonderful teachers. All three of those uh, fall into that category. Um, and Dave. And Dave. And Dave. Um, and the, <laughs> the thing that amazed me when I went to Stockham's, um, you know, sort of digital signal processing course, he showed up with two binders. One binder were his overly organized lecture notes, which were fascinating. The other binding was the definitive answer for any question that anybody in the audience <laughs> could give, at which point it became a competition between the graduate students to come up with a stumper and see if we could find a question that Tom hadn't already prepared for. Um, and I think uh, uh, one of Henry Garot's partners, Patrick Baudelaire, was the first one to come up with the stumper. Um, and it was deeply mathematical, of which Tom was very into that. Um, we also had amazing diversity in the faculty because we had these, you know, just awesome teachers. And then we had the out there guys, like Viavant. He was, let me tell you what idea I came up with this morning type. Um, and then we had Bob Barton, who was much more of an architectural philosopher than he was a computer architect by today's standards. Um, and so he was often preaching to us and hoping that we would come up with something that sort of fit the religion. Um, and we also had an amazingly diverse set of graduate students as well. We had the mathematical wizards, you're gonna hear from Henri tomorrow on the French Connection. Um, we had engineers that came from MIT or wherever. Um, we had people that were uh, very good at programming. We had people that actually knew how to build stuff. My degree, my PhD degree says electrical engineering because I predated the department and departments gave the PhD degree even though uh, the CS and or the bachelor's and master's degree had been, you know, okayed by, you know, the university administration. Anyway, we had people that went on to do famous things. Jim Clark's here, um, founded SGI after his building his graphics ship at Stanford. Um, we have just a bunch of entrepreneurial types that went off to make a difference. We had people that were more boring, like me, that sort of banged around between industry and academia, 
And I got to say, my product was not a company, and I'm very proud of my product. Those graduate students that I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to advise, some are here. We've got Shane here in the front row. We got Ken Stevens, who's faculty in electrical engineering. We've got Mike Parker back here. Um, you know, that's that's my legacy, and I'm I'm very proud of that. Okay. Um, Now, you got to remember these times. These times were, if you can imagine, there were no cell phones. There was no internet. Dwayne sort of, you know, that the copy machines were able to use paper, not chisels and stone. Um, but we were just post Stone Age a little bit. So it was really hard for us to, you know, go and find out what was going on in the, in the global space like it is very easy now. So in in addition to the fact that we were allowed to go places and talk to people, they brought people in. I remember in Ivan's graphics class one time, I walked in uncharacteristically early, um, and there was this Santa Cruz surfer hippie looking dude that was sitting there, and Ivan comes in, the class assembles, and he introduces him as Dave Huffman. I had read everything <laughs> that Huffman had written at that point. Uh, I had no idea that he was a hippie-looking surfer dude. Um, we met, you know, other crazy people like Edsger Dykstra, uh, Tolly Holt, um, and that was very, let's say, um, Chuck uh, and Tolly sort of got me going on what eventually became known as Dataflow, which is my thesis. Okay, so had great grad student peers. We were encouraged to work on impossibly hard problems that people like Ivan and Chuck and Tom would put in front of us. And you know, we'd go up and say, OK, do you have any clue how to get started on this program? And the, the French guys would, would take the mathematical approach. And the computer science guys would say, well, crap, maybe we can approximate this with enough iterations. And maybe we'll be alive <laughs> when it finishes, um, and things like that. So. You know, that was just a springboard for what came next. And I have to say that after my graduate school education, where I've tried very hard to work on problems that were both hard and that if I got right, somebody would care. And that advice came very directly from Ivan. I was so proud of getting the answer uh, to something. And he said, well, that's nice. Go spend your time on something hard next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Anyway, it was a springboard for a career, and as I look back, <laughs> I'm still working because I sucked at retirement. Um, as I look back, you know, it just, it just prepared me for everything that came next. It was, I was curious, I embraced the hard stuff, and sometimes I was able to put a dent in it, sometimes not. Chuck. I was only in Utah for three years, but I have uniformly pleasant memories of that time. I wanted to thank Mary for inviting me to uh, hear for, uh, for what's turned out to be a lot of reminiscences with Al and Dwayne particularly. <laughs> and, uh, so why did I come to Utah? Short answer is Ivan Sutherland. I met Ivan at MIT Lincoln Laboratory in the summer of uh, 1966. Um, and um, I'd finished my first year in graduate school at MIT at the time, and I got a terrific summer job working in Group 23 at Lincoln. Okay, that probably means nothing to most of you, but this is the group that uh, Wesley Clark started and that, that built the TX0 and the TX2 and built the first mini computer and all of this. And I was a junkie for digital design and I was going to get some more experience from the real masters there. Uh, my um, Ivan, in meanwhile, had just finished his tour of duty at uh, ARPA IPT. IPT was the Information Processing Techniques Office of, of ARPA, but now called hmm? IPTOS. IPTO. It's later. IPTO now. It was IPT then. It I was believe. IPT back then. We're being very historically correct. <laughs> you big, young yeah. guys. Yeah, I hit yeah. it. <laughs> you probably still spell it DARPA, but you know it was ARPA back then. And <laughs> so uh, he he had an appointment at Harvard starting that fall, but he spent the summer at Lincoln, um, basically to be close to his own personal computer, the TX2 the machine on which he had done his uh, famous work on Sketchpad. Um, 
but uh, Ivan would, wanting to do some digital design, would come in and with some logic drawings after I showed him how to use a logic template. <laughs> and and uh, he uh, and I would do design reviews with him. So anyway, Ivan and I hit it off pretty well. Um, the um, uh, working on some of the early parts of his three-dimensional display project. Uh, that project continued in the evenings and uh, you know through the school year. I went to work at Harvard the next summer and continued working part time at. Harvard on various parts of the Harvard 3D display. By the summer of 1968, I was consulting for uh, Evans and Sutherland after Ivan moved here. And, um, but my wife and I had driven out here to visit my coworkers at ENS. And um, I had uh, happened to have met uh, Bob Barton at, at one of the ARPA uh, Alta meetings with Tolly Hold and other people who were teaching about com uh, concurrency. Um, and um, we were well underway with the design of the early ENS products at that point. So uh, I became acquainted with Utah and liked it very much. And remember, while all of this was going on, I was still a grad student at MIT. I was an, an instructor at MIT. That's the next level up from teaching assistant and below assistant professor. Yeah, but you signed my PhD thesis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I was a husband and father. And I had written a pretty good PhD thesis. Um, I must have had a lot of energy back so then. So did Barton. He didn't have a PhD. Oh. And, uh, it, was, it was hard keeping up with Ivan and Bob Sproul and, uh, Ivan's team at, uh, at Harvard. Um, long story short, my wife had a, uh, was pregnant and had a placenta previa uh, emergency, but my son was born on the 11th of November, 1969. My, my family all numerologists, so he's born on 11-11. My daughter was born on 5-5. I was born on 1-1. Me too. I'll show you my driver's license if you don't believe me. You and I, I both check. One, one. One, one, yeah. Okay. Dwayne, something else. I'm, I'm not nearly the demon programmer that Dwayne is, oh. but we have the same birthday. <laughs> uh, anyway, I started teaching at the university part time in the spring quarter of 1970. Um, the, uh, I, but I also had to go back to MIT and pay tuition for a full uh, semester in order to defend my thesis. Uh, a lot of my University of Utah time, U time, uh, went into setting up the switching circuits laboratory, uh, which was, uh, uh, if we had it to do over again experience from the one that I set up at MIT, which became the most popular uh, laboratory course at MIT, the Digital Systems Project Lab. And, um, uh, you know, for all the same reasons, uh, we heard it's really good if uh, computer science students know what the understructure is, uh, what it is, how computers work, and what's inside. Um, and, uh, of course, I advise students, and uh, I taught a experimental course on uh, switching and automata theory in which I tried to teach about patri nets and this avant-garde stuff as well. And thanks to Bob Barton, I also got in, in, an interest in education generally. I got uh, to organize a series of workshops on educational kits uh, that was sponsored by IFIPS. And you don't remember IFIPS because it doesn't exist anymore. Or does it? International Federation of Information ah, Processing shame. Societies. This is ancient history, Henry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think part of what made Utah great was that they did not try to be just like other computer science departments. As Al points out, Dave's philosophy really was the 
foundation of the department. You hire good people and let them do interesting, ambitious things. And uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. I got to know him quite well, uh, including going hiking in the Uintas with him and so on. Um, when I was a professor at Caltech, which is an uh, admittedly elitist university, I several times was on committees that um, reviewed other computer science departments, typically with the goal of writing a letter to the dean saying they're really good, but what they need is this, 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 and this. And therefore, the dean would give them some priority in giving them what they needed. Um, the uh, um, Utah was different in having a, uh, uh, they like to build real things. And uh, unfortunately, too many of the departments are just teaching programming or coding or things like that. And uh, it seems like you're doing fine here. Uh, when uh, Mary invited me to give this talk, I knew exactly what her be on this panel. Uh, she said this was um, uh, going to be about computer architecture and computer engineering but it evolved into uh, being mostly reminiscences. I did want to have a brief remembrance here of a favorite student, William C. Athos. He was an uh, undergraduate here. Al knew him very yeah. well. Yeah, he was my TA uh, and a star, and I convinced him to go to PhD uh, program, and I told him he wouldn't get accepted here. I was a faculty member. I'd make sure he wasn't accepted. <laughs> but I knew this guy at Caltech that he might want to talk to. <laughs> it's your story from here. So Bill came to Caltech and did a, a superb um, PhD thesis and uh, was a teacher and everything else. Uh, he did some other things with uh, low power hearing aids and so on, but then ended up you know, going to Apple. And he became Apple fellow number three. Now, number one was Woz himself. <laughs> and uh, I, I never knew who number two was, but Bill was number three. Maybe, um, maybe Steve. Hmm? Maybe Steve Jobs. Nope. No, nope. no, no, no. Steve was number zero. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Bill spoke highly of his fellow, Apple fellow. Um, Bill, and it was very sad for many of us who knew him, uh, passed away just before last Christmas at age 62, premature. Had a wife and a daughter. And, um, so if things had gone according to this being about architecture and computer engineering, uh, I would have given a talk which would be the highlights of a uh, paper or that Bill and I wrote together. Uh, took a couple of months, so we worked really hard on it, and I would recommend it to you. You can't find it, though, because it's uh, IEEE Computer 1988. That's a paper about multi-computers. And Bill and I were somewhat annoyed that a lot of the architecture um, papers gave lip service to programming, but never showed you a program. So we were bold enough to include the source code for three uh, two, actually. Uh, we, there, was, there were originally three, but we had to cut the paper back. Um, interesting, non-trivial, multi-computer programs. These are concurrent programs that spawn processes and do all sorts of fun stuff, uh, you know, in the paper. And um, so all of us who remembered Bill, um, the topic of multi-computers isn't exactly current today, but it is because exactly the same programming and communication techniques, message passing techniques are what people use today in compute clusters, which 
you could almost say is the dominant computer architecture today. Even Al, I believe, agrees with that. Yep. Data flow, Al, thinks that's true. <laughs> You're right. It's all about the data center. That phone you guys carry around, if the data center wasn't there, just a phone. It would be the <laughs> So Chuck, uh, what made you leave Utah? Well, that's an easy question. <laughs> uh, it was the allure of California. Uh, no, I, I, I liked Utah, and I certainly enjoyed skiing, and I didn't miss the beaches so much. But uh, it was the allure of California. Mm -hmm. My consulting clients were there, mostly. Uh, including uh, Bob Barton's lab that when he got uh, Burroughs to set up a lab in La Jolla, mm -hmm. California, where we would go swimming at lunch, snorkeling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were doing some kind of interesting work there. I was working on uh, uh, digital video, I'm going back a little bit into graphics, but this was all raster graphics. And amongst other things, we developed the techniques that um, you, Frank Crow uh, also published about. But we, our patent is about a year before uh, Frank's publications about using grayscale to, um, for, uh, to eliminate the jaggies on the edges of uh, characters and lines and other figures. Uh, this is a way of getting the maximum resolution out of a raster display. And you, you know something, uh, the young people who were here just before, I call them young, were uh, talking about teaching undergraduate programs and having to fit 10 pounds in a five pound bag. We were in a graduate program and David Evans philosophy, he told me that when I went down to teach at BYU afterwards and he said what he did is he got the best people he could. And then the department, the department would become what those people did and who they were. And because it was a graduate program, there's more flexibility. I remember some kid wanted to do AI at the time, which some of us used to say, oh, a artificial intelligence is for the artificially intelligent. <laughs> and, and we didn't happen to have an AI big deal guy. And so Dave arranged for the kid to go off to Stanford. And, mm -hmm. I mean, and he, he, he was not, he didn't have a problem with that. The CS department graduate program at Utah was what the, the faculty were. Tom Stockham came, absolutely top of He didn't do graphics. He did some image processing. It was very interesting. But he was the, ended up being the father of digital recording. And when Chuck went down to La Jolla at Bob Barton's lab in 19... 71, and I was just finishing up, and we teased, I ended up being invited to come, to come down there because Ivan and, and Bob Barton both told me, they, Ivan says, are you going down to BYU to teach? And I said, well, they've asked if I'd come, and I'm, you know, it's my church's school and everything, and, and Ivan said, we did not give you the education we gave you just so you could go down and teach your guts out at an undergraduate institution. I didn't take his advice. I wish I had, because I, <laughs> I went down and I taught my guts out at an undergraduate institution. We, we got Chuck's laboratory gear, his digital logic gear, and we set up a logic lab. Oh, I think we were twice the size of U of U's logic lab. We had you know, 30, 40 computer science students and 30, 40 double E students at, in tandem taking the digital logic design course. We, we got some of his artwork to make the circuit boards. We, um, I, he gave me a copy of his class notes and all, and we used that, and then embellished on it a little bit later. And, and I hadn't taken Chuck's course, and I was embarrassed at finding that I was teaching logic design as my primary thing, and Chuck said, yeah, but you had me for a tutor down in La Jolla. <laughs> <laughs> uh, down in La Jolla, by the way, some of you are old enough to remember that, do you remember Captain Video, the, the TV program? Early, early on, it was a TV program and it was a guy by the name of Captain Video, and Gary Watkins is there chuckling away. And, and they called, <laughs> down there they called Chuck Captain Video. I had worked with Tom Stockham quite a bit, and they called me Captain Audio. Audio. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, then, and then Al Davis even came down and did a stint down there. So the three of us didn't end up at Xerox Park. We ended up at Bob Barton's lab. In it's Ohio. a very incestuous world. <laughs> and, and Bob Johnson, where, where, where is Mary? Mary's right there, Bob Johnson's wife. And Bob Johnson was a vice president at Burroughs of Engineering. And he's the one that put up with Bob Barton and funded our lab in La Jolla. And then later, Bob's, I forgot to tell you, location was very important. And Alta Lodge was a big deal part of the, the program then. And we used to have, our DARPA had workshops up there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, where did I see Bob Sproul? He's in the back. He's seen all that time. And Bob Sproul had been to some of those workshops. And he was from Harvard, right? I, did, I knew of Bob Sproul's name. He didn't have any idea who I was. But we were there at some of these workshops. They were, they were, uh, they were the DARPA meetings people coming in from all over, the, not just, the, mostly the country, I guess, for mm -hmm. DARPA. And the meetings they would hold were up at Alta Lodge. They were, they were workshops. They, I don't hear too well, so I... They were called workshops. Workshops. The serious yes. meetings. But, they, but they let us graduate students come up to them, too, and they had nice rooms for the, for the various faculty members, <laughs> big professionals. And they had a dormitory area that we graduate students were invited to come up and stay in. And, and so... The place was not just University of Utah on this campus, in the Merrill Engineering Building. It was also Alta Lodge. <laughs> Al, do, do you have any, any, any regrets from your time here? Anything you would do differently? I do. Um, when I was a graduate student here, it was the most fun I've ever had. Um, why I decided to leave after the minimum amount of time when I had achieved the right number of credit hours that they would give me a PhD <laughs> is absolutely beyond me. Um, and I should have stayed longer, even after my advisor left, I should have said, hey, just sign everything, I'll turn it in later, and I'll, I'll do whatever, I'll do some more research, whatever, because the faculty made it such a good place for us. We were so lucky to be at the right spot, at the right time, when these brilliant, inspiring faculty members gave us you know, young, malformed brains, in my case, uh, interesting problems to work on. And man, I could have stayed for a long time. You know, if you're going to work for another 50 years, what's your rush in getting out early? I mean, <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. Plus, he's a very hot dog skier. <laughs> he, he was the best among us. I, I, I do and want to open it up for a couple of questions from the audience. No? Sorry. Mary, no? <laughs> OK. Oh, we did it. All right, so, so, so to keep on time, let's, let's wrap up here. Thank you so much for all that insight. Rajiv, may I, say, may I say just one other thing? You're rummaging through things. Henry Garo, at one time, I was in the bank going to make a loan for some tuition, and he happened to walk in the bank. He may not remember this, but I do. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making a loan so I can pay my tuition next semester. And Henry said, Stop it. And he got it out of his checkbook, and he wrote out a check for my tuition. Do you remember? No. I probably <laughs> I, but, but right here, <laughs> but, but right here, we, we found this little notebook my wife found. And on this page, it says, this is a little after graduate school, and it says, Al, read what it says down here. Uh, I can't. It says, Davis, <laughs> it says, Davis owes me for his Alta Lodge bill. Fifty-six dollars and ninety cents. You all, no, no, just we're paid just, up. Just give it, give it to Henry. Give it, give it to Henry. Okay.